All right, so we are going to continue whoa, <laughs> with um, the student presentations. Our presentations coming up will be Maxima Acuna, um, which is from Peru, Ashley Liu, Jessica Monhan, Tatiana Millet Joke, is that right? Okay, perfect. Um, like we said before, uh, question and answer will be at the end of the presentations. If you need to use the restroom at any time, just quietly excuse yourselves. Um, you guys have done a pretty good job so far, so thank you very much. While these ladies are getting their PowerPoint ready, again, I encourage you guys to eat bagels, um, get coffee, do what you need to do to take care of it, and it's going to kind of keep rolling like this because we are live streaming. If people don't know that, you can go to Big Sky High School's website and find the live stream link that's linked to MCAT. So I'd like to also uh, thank MCAT, the uh, Missoula Community Access Television. In the back there is Ron filming. He's been here all day. And it's really awesome that MCAT is uh, offered to help the students out. So one little quick applause for MCAT as we get ready here. Let's get the show on the road. Can we just? Yeah. Can we just start? Okay, play. There's no one in here. It's okay. Yeah, I know, that's why I said it. it's okay. Oh, awesome, okay. So, Mayama, Ashley. Oh, Mayama, Jessica. Y Tatiana millet -Yauk. Okay, and nuestra presentación es sobre Maxima Acuña de Peru. Excellent. Okay. El lugar. La República de Peru es un país soberano del oeste de América del Sur. El Oceano Pacífico bordea su... Costa ilimita con Ecuador y Colombia al norte, Brasil al este y Bolivia y Chile al sureste. Su territorio se compone de, uh, de diversos pa paisajes, um, los va valles, las mestas y las altas cumbres de los Andes se despliegan al oeste hacia la costa um, desértica y al este hacia la Amazonia. Es uno de los países de mayor diversidad biológica del mundo y de mayores recursos miner minerales. Okay. okay. La tarea. Um, en 1994, Máxima Acuña y su esposo compraron un terreno en un rincón apartado de las tareas Um, altas en el norte del Perú, conocido como trag Tragadero Grande, um, construyeron una pequeña casa en la propiedad y vivi vivieron um, una vida pacífica, criando ahí a sus hijos. La familia vivía vivi vi ah, sorry, lo siento, de las papas y otros cultivos y además tenían ovejas y vacas para la leche y el queso. A veces Acuña hacía el largo trayecto al pueblo para vender vegetales, alimentos lácteos y artesanías de lana. Nunca había aprendido a leer y escribir, pero sabía que la, la tarea era su. Sin embargo, Numa declaró que la estructura existente casa seguirá siendo hasta que el caso judici judicial um, alrededor de la liga, legalidad de que la estructura construida en 2011 en tarea que Yanacocha adquirió en. Um, 1996 y 97 se resuelve en los tribunales. Un día en el 2011, la empresa minera llegó al hogar de los Acuña y exigió de que dejaron su terreno. Cuando Acuña se negó, fue sometida a la brutalidad de la minera. Llegaron fuerzas armadas a destruir su hogar y pertenencias y la golpearon 
a ella y a una de sus hijas hasta dejarlas inconscientes. Numan ha negado haber uh, dicho que era pacífica y que la tierra que el Yanacocha tratando fue comprada de la Chaupes en 1996. Uh, la persecución continuó. La empresa minera demandó a la familia campesina en una corte de provincia, la cual vida misma encontró culpable a la familia de ocupar ileg ilegal ilegalmente su propio terreno. A Máxima Acuña fue con condenada a una pena de prisión de casi tres años, uh, la cual fue suspendida y recibió una multa de casi dos mil dólares, una suma enorme para una agricultura de subsistencia en Perú. Acuña pidió la ayuda legal de Grufides, una NGO ambiental en Cajamarca que estaba representando a miembros de la comunidad en casos contra compañías mineras. Con la ayuda de su abogada, Mirtha Vesquez, um, apeló la decisión de la Corte y empezó a reunir docu documentos como el título de propiedad que compro comprobaba que ella tenía derecho legítimo al terreno que reclamaba Numont. En diciembre del 2014, las Cortes emitieron un fallo a su favor. Su, co su condena de prisión fue anulada y la Corte detuvo se su desalojo. Como res resultado de esta victoria legal, se ha impedido el ingreso del proyecto Conga en Tragadero Grande. Numat no ha podido seguir adelante con ninguna min miniera Minería en la región alrededor de la Laguna Azul. Máxima Acuña sigue enfrentándose a las amenazas y al hostigamiento por parte de la, min por parte de la minera a sus fuerzas de seguri seguridad, la privada, seguridad privada y militarizada. Uh, las Compañías mineras han construido un cerco alre alrededor del terreno de máxima, uh, restringiendo a su cap capacidad de desplazarse libremente en la región. Han destruido sus, sus cultivos de papa y mantienen una estrella vigilancia sobre su propiedad para impedir a él ella, hace, ella siempre más. Numa es básicamente tratando de hacer, uh, arrestarla a través de la corte hasta que Ma Máxima está en bancarrota. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. Um, ¿qué más? Um. <laughs> Mientras tanto, en la Corte Suprema de Perú se sigue dando la lucha legal, la cual seguramente dará paso a más apelaciones y demandas. A pesar de la trama y el cansancio, Acuña mantiene un notable, un notable optimismo en su lucha contra por la justicia. Se ha vuelto una persona muy conocida a lo largo de América Latina por su valentía valentía inspiradora al enfrentarse a una campa compañía minera multinacional. El proyecto con Conga no ha avanzado. La comunidad <coughs> se ha solid sol solidarizado con Máxima y su logro ha traído nueva vida a, a la lucha para defender los problemas de cada marca, reservas de agua y las comunidades de los impactos de la minera de oro de gran escala. Uh. Uh, muchas gracias a Jay Bostrom y Ma uh, Ryan Mack de Goldman Prize y uh, Christy, Christy para la ayuda y sí, gracias. <laughs> All right, so 
our, okay, Pedro's in here. So our next group is Pedro, Matt, and Miguel, and they are presenting on Konai. Is that you said? Hola, buenos días. Yo me llamo Miguel Bravo y aquí soy acompañado con mis compañeros Matt Took y Pedro Dueñas y vamos a hablar de nuestra presentación de CONAI. ¿Quién es CONAI? Son las Confederación de Nacionales de Indígenas Personas de Ecuador. Se han formado en 1980 para proveer representación para las comunidades indígenas de Ecuador. Ellos se han formado de todas las indígenas organizaciones en Ecuador. Con ahí trabaja para recuperar la propiedad indígena para rescatar su lengua y cultura. Nos ayudan para promover unidad para todas las naciones indígenas y sus problemas. ¿Qué hace con ahí y qué significa con ahí? Con ahí ayuda a muchos tribus indígenas en el Amazon para recuperar su propiedad. Que las personas de la compañía Chevron y Texaco robaron. Unos tribus que con ahí ayudan son Cofán, Secoya, Siona, Urani, Lolan, Quicha, Shuar, Achuar, Shiwiar y Zapara Naciones y muchos más. Conaí está ayudando a los tribus del Amazon porque es que las compañías de Chevron y Texaco tiraron un chingo de petróleo en el bosque del Amazon. Uh, so, Texaco's uh, problema, um, el gran pro problema de Texaco es en piezo, or, yeah. Um, su supuestamente tenían que inventar acerca de 10 billones de dolores para limpiar. La Amazonia para ellos limpiaron una pequeña parte y solo pegaron uh, 40 millones de dolores. Ok, como todos saben, yo soy un estudiante de intercambio de Ecuador y estamos presentando un, un, una organización que está ayudando que la compañía Chevron ha ensuciado mucho la Amazonía del Ecuador. Como pueden ver aquí, mucha, mucha destrucción masiva en, en, la, en la Amazonía y lo que tratan de, de arreglar es que estas empresas cumplan su deber porque... Ellos dijeron que iban a limpiar como 15 mil, no, eh, 15 mil millo, billones de dólares invertidos en estas limpiezas, pero nunca lo hicieron, limpiaron como el 10%. Y, y, y no es justo que muchas tribus que están viviendo ahí, en nuestros lugares, han tenido cáncer, han muerto muchas, muchos animales, eh, han estado muriendo mucho, especies extintas y mucho más. Y esto se ha esparcido mucho durante los años cuando ellos están... Lo que a ellos solo les importa es, solo es el dinero que ellos ganan cuando, cuando expl, eh, explotan mucho la tierra y solo venden el petróleo al, al exterior y no se dan cuenta que están destruyendo su propio país. Esta es una resistencia que... Eh, los pueblos indígenas y las tribus han organizado por su cuenta y nosotros tuvimos la oportunidad de íbamos a hablar con, un, con el director de este programa pero no se pudo dar la no, no pudimos hablar por un inconveniente que tuvimos pero hemos consultado mucho el internet y lo que hemos encontrado es esta organización que ha estado sirviendo y tratando de organizar para que esta empresa termine de, de arreglar este problema que tiene la Amazonía. Uh, como ven, 
muchas, muchas partes de la Amazonía han sido afectadas y los lagos principalmente uh, han sido un poco limpiados, pero no de su totalidad, no todos de ellos. Esas son un poco de imágenes que hemos encontrado en el internet. Ah, sí, muchas gracias. All right. Next up is Tyler Best, and he will be talking about Yasunidos, an indigenous group from Ecuador. Okay. Hola. Um, me llamo Tyler Best. Mi presentación es en los Yasunidos y la lucha a salvar Yasuni Parque Nacional en Ecuador. Um, el Yasuni es un uh, parque nacional y está ubicado en la región amazónica dentro de las provincias de Pastaza y Orellana. Cuenta con 982 mil hectáreas como las provincias de Pichincha y Esmeraldas juntas. Um, en 1979 fue declarado Parque Nacional. En 1989, un área aún mayor del parque fue declarada Reserva de la Biosfera por la UNESCO por su riqueza natural y cultural. <coughs> en la zona coexistan guarani, quichuas, shuar, colonos y mestizos. Además, en el Yasuni también habitan las Tagare y Tarumenane, conocidos como indígenas aislados, que se car caracterizan por no tener ningún contacto y su vida está precotada. Pre Telada, uh, por varias herramientas uh, constitucionales. Oh, that sucks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, estos son los principios de los yacenidos uh, según a las, los yacenidos. Somos jóvenes, pero también somos estudiantes, campesinos, artistas, obreros madres, padres, niños, niñas y activistas. Somos apartidistas, pero no somos apolíticos. Somos ecologistas, uh, animalistas, feministas, pro derechos, conf uh, conflu confluimos en la diversidad. Rechazamos que el extra, extractivismo sea la única forma de produ, producir riqueza. Practica, practicamos resistencia, pero no somos violentos. Somos pasivistas, pero no pasivos. Queremos un mundo diferente, pero no somos ingenuos. Basamos nuestros ideales en la realidad del cambio climático, de la crisis de agua, de la irreversible uh, ex extinción de la biodiversidad y del et etnocido de los pueblos indígenas. Buscamos cambiar el ent antropocentrismo y uh, patriarcado del hombre en relaciones horizontales basadas en el respeto hacia la naturaleza, al res resto de animales y entre uh, nosotros mismos. Defendemos nuestra uh, constitución, la más ecologista del plan planeta. 
Queremos salir de la dependencia del petróleo y de los uh, recursos naturales. Repudiamos a Chevron. No uh, queremos que se repita esta uh, historia en ne ninguna parte del mundo nunca más. Defendemos la democracia contra el fraude, la mentiras, la politización de nuestros sueños. All right. Los antagonistas de los Estados Unidos son las compañías petróleas como Chevron, um, que desean extraer petróleo del Parque uh, Nacional de Suni, rico en petróleo. Sin embargo, más específicamente, el antagonista principal de Estados Unidos es el presidente de Ecuador, Rafael Correa. Um, <coughs> El presidente parecía ser muy útil para la lucha de Estados Unidos cuando hizo un proyecto de ley que detener la extracción del um, petróleo en el Yasuni. Sin embargo, el proyecto um, de ley que implica una meta impasable um, para que el resto del mundo donan el dinero suficiente para ascender a los ingresos que el país habría hecho por la extracción de petróleo. Por supuesto, este objetivo no se cumplió y ahora el presidente está permitiendo a, a Chevron a entrar al Yasuni y estar lista para perforar. So. Um, hay otras formas de mejorar nuestra calada, cal, calidad de vida. Um, incrementar 1.5% de impuestos a los um, 110 grupos uh, eco, económicos más grandes del país a la canazaría, una gran uh, gan, ganancia de USA. Um, Viente, uh, uh, just 20 million, 585 million dollars uh, in Viente Cinco, es decir, y um, 2 point, 293 million uh, dollars más de lo uh, que alega el gobierno que se logra, lograría explotando el bloque um, 43 o ITT. Um, otras altern alternativas. Um, nacionalizar la teléfono celular, focalizar subsidios, um, apostar al turismo comunitario, implementar uh, energías uh, renovables y desarrollar el bioconocimiento. Gracias. Okay, our next group's coming up right now. Thank you very much, Tyler. Who? Ten o'clock. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, as this next group comes up, they're going to talk about Oscar Oliveira. One thing I want to make a comment about just to the general public, and I'm going to say this in English, is the group that's about to present, as well as the group that did Maximo Cunha and the group that started this office this morning, Berta Caceres, had a Skype session with the Goldman Environmental Prize. And for those that don't know what that is, it's, it's something akin to a uh, United Nations Prize or Nobel Prize for amazing human beings. And um, all three of them sat down and this guy gave us like almost two hours of his time in, out of San Francisco to talk about each one of these extraordinary prize winners. The gentlemen about to present are going to talk about Oscar Oliveira, who um, famously was involved in the water wars of Bolivia. They'll, they'll explain to you all of the, the story about him. Um, just to prime you guys a little bit, uh, I do want to thank you for your patience. Um, students are doing a great job with their presentations, but stay patient with us. And immediately after this next, uh, these next two presentations by students, 
Um, they're gonna, there's going to be a guest speaker uh, from Guatemala who's an indigenous leader himself, which would be very exciting. You guys will find him very fascinating. He's brilliant and funny and just an awesome guy and great stories and great adventures. So I really hope you uh, stick around to hear him. And he's going to do that in English. Hola. Uh, nuestra presentación es sobre Oscar Oliveira, un uh, activista boliviano del agua. Uh, uh, nació en uh, 1956 en Oruro, Bolivia. Uh, um, antes de la guerra del agua, era un dirigente sindical para los trabajadores ah, ah, y es una persona muy importante en ah, el, ah, en la guerra del, del agua. Ah, vi, ah, vi, Ah, uh, no, sorry. Uh, vive en Cochabamba, uh, Bolivia, y ah, uh, sí. Es muy importante de algo de lo que quiero Sí. Ah, yeah. uh -huh. aquí es uh, un mapa es Cochabamba en Bolivia. So, la Juega de Agua, en 1999, uh, el gobierno de uh, Cochabamba uh, privatizó el agua de Cochabamba. Uh, miles de personas protestaron a uh, la privatización del agua en Cochabamba, uh, bloquearon los calles de Cochabamba con... Uh, Uh, um, bloques de uh, el calle. Um, uh, una corporación de uh, uh, privatizaron el, uh, uh, la agua en la Cochabamba es Bechtel. Um, Bechtel y uh, muchas multinacionales de uh, todo el mundo uh, privat, uh, uh, hicieron una junta, junta aventura de um, privatizar el agua en la Cochabamba. Um, es uh, una pintura de uh, los uh, bloques de los calles. Es un uh, grupo de protesters. Um, Oscar um, Oliveira negoció con el go gobierno por uh, el deprivatización de agua en uh, Cochabamba. Uh, Oscar y un uh, gro grupo de protestas uh, formaron una uh, coordinadora. Uh, el nombre es uh, la Coordinadora por la Defensa del Agua y Vida y uh, su sus, uh, misión uh, era uh, sí, to, uh, parar a uh, Aguas del Tenari, uh, lo, el multinacional que uh, privatizaron el agua en uh, Bolivia. Alright, so después de uh, Agos de Queda de Agua en Bolivia, en abril de 2012, um, Oscar estableció Fundación Abril. Uh, uh, desafío de Fundación Abril es limpio de Rio Rocha. 
en esa hora en activistas y miembros de comunidad en Bolivia uh, construyó construyendo una planta de tratamiento de agua para boliviana, bolivianas, sí. Uh, y ellos limpiar um, Rio Rocha. It's pretty dirty. <laughs> sí. Ah, uh, sí. Yeah. Fundación Abril, uh, originalmente fundada de, er, para Oscar y miembros de comunidad de Boliviana um, antes o er, después de los que eres de algo así. Gracias. Sí, gracias. All right, so our final group is Desqua, which is Natalie Schwab, Casey Nelson, and Rachel Levison. Yeah. Where's the start button? Yeah. Hola, buenos dias. Hola, y gracias por venir hoy. Mi nombre es Casey, <laughs> somos estudiantes de las escuelas de secundario Big Sky. Mi nombre es Rachel, estamos encantados de informales sobre la organización que estamos representando hoy, Desqua. Hola, mi nombre es Natalie, también hablaremos sobre el genocidio Guatemala y mostrar un trailer, trailer Corto dirigido por el cofundador de Desqua, Willy Breno. Whoops. Desqua es una red de base de organización comunitarias de las tierras altas de Guatemala. Están trabajando para establecer el sueño guatemalteco para que más personas migrar desde los Estados Unidos. Des Desqua es una red para organizar el pueblo para una red sociedad postcapitalística. El genocidio. Después del líder democrático de que Ahabo Arbenz fue dedicado por Estados Unidos, los romanos afirmando Arbenz era comunista. Un nuevo líder se puso en el poder que Carlos Castillo Amarns tomó el poder provocando la guerra civil guatemalteca. El ejército de guatemalteca comenzó una campaña contra los indios mayas que afirmaban que estaban trabajando con un golpe de estados comunista. El ejército atacó 626 pueblos mató a 200 mil y un el punto sino 5 millón de desfasados. El genocidio fue llamado el silencio holocauste. Aquí hay un trail, el trailer de documental La Voz de un Montaña que explica mucho sobre el genocidio. Nosotros tenemos experiencia de 28 años de, en el caso mío. Pues. Muchas de nuestras familias, amigos, no entendían tampoco por qué se tomaban las armas para luchar por un mejor futuro. Both of them were, for the most part, radicalized students, workers, and peasants who had reached the conclusion that there was just no alternative in a country like Guatemala but to try to bring down the government through the force of arms. 28 años de lucha. 28 años de la clandestinidad, 28 años de, de poner mi cerebro a la inteligencia pues, de, de la guerra. 
ahora es diferente. Tengo 12 años apenas de la escuela de café. Que cuando, desde que nosotros llegamos empezamos a cortar café, pues nosotros también pues desde el principio no sabíamos cortar café. La misma café nos enseña a uno para cortar. Y ahí él se va a defender de su mano de usted. Pues. Decidí venirme y continuar otra vez luchando, ya no, con un, ya no empuñando un arma, sino luchando así a decidir. Estamos luchando pues como para lograr el objetivo que nosotros queremos lograr, lo que nosotros queremos alcanzar. Pues. Sin que hay que llevar mucho proceso pues para lograr tener todo eso en adelante. Pues. Por eso nosotros ahorita pues que queremos que Guatemala que sea digna, que sea así, haya paz en Guatemala. En el futuro eh, estar al frente de mis alumnos y platicarles también un poquito la historia va cómo era la guerra y todo eso, y esas son mis esperanzas en el futuro. La misión es para redes de la comunidad binacional en colaboración para el cambio social. Juntos estamos creando cambios fundamentales para encontrar modelos económicos sostenibles y una forma digna de vida. Los cuatro pilares de Desqua. Memoria histórica, la comprensión de cómo la modernización y diferentes formas de gobernar afectó la manera una persona trabaja. Migración y globalización, entender la actualidad del mundo y su influencia en las cantidades masivas de migrantes en todo el mundo. Cosmovisión y identidad maya, ser consciente de su entorno y raíces ancestrales para entender lo que la naturaleza tiene que enseñarles. Economía alternativa y empresas sociales. Tomar el control de la economía y la utilización de lo que la naturaleza ofrece. Luchar por la autonomía y autosuficiencia. Un aspecto de Desqua es Café Red, ejecutar un restaurante en Chesaltenango, Guatemala, que promueve la educación, el comercio de precio y oportunidad local. Okay. Es un honor presentarles al co-fundador del Desqua y nuestro bien amigo Willy Moreno. So I'm really excited to um, introduce a friend of mine and an extraordinary human being, uh, Willy Barreno. And I'll let him tell his story and, and introduce himself as, as he would wish. And um, what we'll do is uh, let uh, Willie talk for a few minutes, give us some comments and thoughts on this project and what he's doing and uh, the girls he's had a chance to interact with here and tell us about his friends and and uh, all the important things. And then if there's time, we'll, we'll let some students come up and ask you some questions or community members, if, if that's okay with you, Willie. Yes. All right, take it away. All right, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really, really happy that uh, um, I'm part of this conference today. Uh, my name is uh, Willy Barreno. Uh, I'm originally from Guatemala, and um, I always like to say that uh, the reason I'm speaking English uh, this morning is because somehow I was forced 
to learn uh, the language uh, in order to defend myself against discrimination and racism in the US. Um, I was uh, about 22, 23 years when I got to the US, uh, a little bit like a political and economical refugee. Um, didn't know any English when I got there, and it was 1996 when I, I started learning English. Uh, today is, and it's been about 20 years later. Uh, I'm uh, representing the people of Guatemala. Uh, something that you have to be really aware of is that uh, Willy Barreno doesn't exist. Uh, I'm just a, a blend of many uh, experiences uh, throughout my 43 years of life on this planet. Um, I was in Mozula in 2008, uh, leading a speaking tour talking about Plan Mexico and also about the indigenous movement, the Zapatistas in Chiapas that you guys probably will hear later on uh, today. Um, I represent the culture. Uh, uh, one of the five most important uh, civilizations on the planet called the Mayans. Uh, a very important fact that you need to uh, uh, be aware is that in the Mayan calendar, uh, this year is the 5,132 year. So I'm just gonna repeat that again. So you guys uh, are aware about our accounting time for us is the year 5,132. Uh, Jesus was just born like uh, you know, 2016 years ago. And so we are doubling up the time that we've been organized ourselves on this land. Um, like uh, I, I was hearing, you know, since a half hour ago, you guys' presentations, you know, um, I'm really, uh, I feel, feel very humble and very honored that you guys are uh, learning about Latin America, about the different struggles in Bolivia and Peru, you know, Mexico, Ecuador, and I think we all uh, share the same story on this continent. Um, I, I'm, I'm for sure know that there is a, a lot of Native Americans in Montana. Uh, so the, the, when Columbus came, he didn't discover anything. You know, this is a, like a, a really wrong, you know, concept of uh, discovering America because we've been here for a long, long time. Um, so we as indigenous, we don't, I mean, like I, uh, on my behalf, I'm, I'm rethinking about the concept of being Guatemala or being Guatemala because Guatemala, it's a country or a concept or a constitution that was created by the Spaniards. You know, just like uh, in the US, you know, uh, before uh, Europeans came to the US, a lot of Native Americans live from coast to coast. Um, so we, we, for the Mayans, uh, Guatemala, the country that the Spaniards built, it's the size of the state of Tennessee. But then we have over uh, 22 languages. If we include Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador, we speak about 33 languages. Uh, I was uh, having a, um, a Skype conference with, with the students that present this about two weeks ago, and I was explaining to them that in our Mayan languages, there is no translation for hour, for minute, or second. And this is a very important fact to understand about time, because the concept of uh, hour, minute, or second was created during the Industrial Revolution in Europe. So we all today are submitted to, to like I call it modern slavery, when you are controlled by the hour, the minute, or the second. You know, I have only have 45 minutes to talk today. <laughs> 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 right? And uh, it seems like uh, uh, this modern civilization, we're always running against time. You know, we're always running, running, running. And that's why I see a lot of... Uh, people nervous when you talk, you know, because you only have five minutes or 10 minutes and you're pressured, right? So um, on behalf of, of, of uh, the organization that I represent is something that in 2008, we, we created the, the network DESWA and believe it or not, but uh, we thought about creating a, a disorganization 
not in Guatemala, not in the Mayan lands, but I was living in New York. And it was in Brooklyn and Manhattan, where I was like one of the fast cities I ever lived in my life. You know, I was having a lot of like anxiety and uh, some psychologists said that I was bipolar. You know, and I have ADD because I couldn't fit into, into that city. So the idea for us, it was to uh, return to Guatemala and start like um, thinking about what's the purpose of life and what's, what's the, the memory we have. Um, I think you guys saw the trailer of Voice of a Mountain. At the beginning, you see some indigenous uh, carrying weapons. I don't know if you saw that. Yes. As uh, they were carrying weapons, I was the one who was speaking in Spanish. Because as me as a kid, uh, I grabbed a gun when I was uh, 18 years old because I joined the guerrilla forces. They were uh, uh, fighting against the, the Guatemalan army. And then the Guatemalan army, it was backed up and it was trained by the U.S. Army, you know. I think 90% of the weapons and 90% of the bullets and bombs that killed 200,000 people in Guatemala came from the U.S. This is really important to understand. And uh, I think uh, uh, Guatemala, or in, back in the, in, the, in the 40s, we had a revolution and that revolution wanted to give land, wanted to give education, wanted to give uh, uh, health and rights to indigenous people in Guatemala. Uh, important fact, you know, the, the indigenous population in Guatemala, we're about 65% of the population, 40% is mixed, and only like 7% of Spanish descendants. So Guatemala, it's a whole blend of Maya culture, but we don't have access to power or we don't have access to governments uh, and we've been colonized for the last 500 years. So finally, you know, back in the 60s, we grabbed the guns and we started fighting against the government. And what did we get? It was a lot of U.S. intervention that, like uh, students were saying, it became a, a silent holocaust. Today, we still have 50,000 people disappear. We don't know where their bodies are. And about, like, uh, in the PowerPoint they were mentioning, 1.5 million people were displaced. Uh, today, you know, there is one million and a half Mayans living in the U.S. I don't think that they have any in Montana, but I've seen Mayans working in potato fields in Idaho. I've seen Mayans cutting wood in Oregon and picking up tomatoes in Florida. So today there is a lot of Mayan languages being spoken uh, in the U.S. This is a product of displacement, and this is something new that we call it globalization. So today in the U.S. there is a lot of talk about migrants. You know that there is about 12 million undocumented migrants from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and South America. And if you see a lot of immigrants in the U.S., is because U.S. has influenced the economics through multinational companies and destroyed, you know, villages. Uh, we, we're talking about Texaco, we're talking about Walmart, we're talking about Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's. It's everywhere today in Latin America, and that's basically destroying our small cultures and when you cannot compete with potatoes, you know, because McDonald's sells very cheap French fries, people will have to live and find jobs somewhere else. You know, we used to grow a lot of corn, we used to grow a lot of wheat and our own vegetables, and now Walmart is destroying all our small crops, and that's what you get, you know, a lot of people fleeing the country. Uh, often you hear about the refugee crisis in North Africa or in the Middle East, then there is also a silent refugee uh, escape from our lands to the U.S. <clears throat> so in 2008, we returned to Guatemala in the search of our memory. I think it's really important for us to understand uh, where we come from and to understand the history of our people. 
And that's why today we are working in Mayan communities. Finally, I'm recovering my own culture. I'm recovering uh, my mathematical way of seeing life. Um, uh, we are recovering uh, our natural resources. And also, again, we are fighting against multinational companies. Like some other students were presenting about, you know, the mining, so the hydroelectricals in Peru or the water resistance in Bolivia. Uh, we are facing exactly the same thing here in Guatemala. So uh, all the presentations you guys had are, you know, kind of remind me and kind of hit me a little bit from different sides of, of my brain and my memory that, you know, this is a global struggle about big corporations in a system that is destroying even small farmers in Montana, right? Oh, yeah. I believe it's happening everywhere. So for us, you know, that's why we are creating not an organization, we are trying to disorganize, we are trying to deconstruct, you know, what the system has built on us. And the idea right now is that we need to start from scratch. We need to start from, you know, from the beginning. And I was telling you know, some of the students there that I think our best teachers today are, you know, the, uh, the stations of nature. Everything all right there? We're doing great. We're doing great. Yeah. We're just, you know, knocking cans around in the back. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start us off with a, a question for you, and then I'm going to ask students and uh, community members to just come up and, and feel free to grab the mic and interact with you. And, uh, and so my question is, Desgua, you explained to us, um, is your organization, and you talk about disorganizing Guatemala and also and because of Spanish, the translation doesn't work, but also sort of decolonizing. Um, can you talk about disorganization, decolonizing, and then as a follow-up, talk about um, immigrant study abroad. I love that idea. What was that last time? That's Tim? Immigrant study abroad, being, a, being an immigrant that's uh, doing uh, foreign exchange. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea of this, this organizing is that uh, Often, you know, you get the Peace Corps, you get like USID or different organizations from like European Union that come to developing countries and they said, oh, we're going to organize the Indians because they live in poverty. You know, oh, they, they are, you know, they're ignorant. They, you know, they don't know uh, what uh, uh, whole milk is, for example. Right? They said, oh, they cannot communicate with us because they only speak Mayan languages and they don't sound okay in Spanish or English. So we're going to go and educate them. We're going to go and uh, teach them how to read and write, for example. Uh, I think, you know, this is a very, way, uh, very wrong way of a uh, European way of thinking that you are going to colonize, you know. I often say that in the U.S. they call us minorities, you know, like Asians, Africans, and Hispanics, we are call ourselves minorities. But then if you see a whole, you know, map of, of, of the planet Earth, I think we are the majority of the population on the planet. Right? So I think it's really important to discuss, you know, who has the power today uh, on the planet, I think. You know, you, I, I hate to say this, but Europe and, and the U.S. control the world culture today. Right now, people are like, whatever you see in Hollywood, that's what you, you, you should follow, you know. Whatever thought of philosophy comes from Europe or from the U.S., this is what you have to follow. And I think, you know, I, I, I come back again into the year 5,132 year of the Mayan calendar. I think we have our own philosophers. We have our own way of uh, writing, that it's not necessarily the alphabet. You know, we have our own, you know, ecosystems and how can we grow whatever we want. I think, you know, today I'm addicted to coffee. And, and no one in my family, you know, the Mayan family that I have, no one drinks coffee. So where in the hell I got the coffee addiction? <laughs> living in the U.S., you know, and now I, I go back and, 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 and study the history of coffee, and then coffee comes from, from Africa, 
right? And then back in Vienna and back in Germany, you know, 150 years ago, students needed a lot of uh, drink. I mean, a drink that would lift you up. And then coffee became popular in Europe, you know, for college students. So the Germans grabbed coffee seeds from Africa and brought them to Guatemala, and we started growing coffee here. But then the coffee we grow, it's only to export. So Guatemalans don't drink coffee. We, we drink chocolate because cocoa beans is the most sacred you know, seed from the Maya civilizations. So I think the addiction I got is from the US. Right? So I have to relearn that you know my people drink chocolate, not coffee. So this is kind of part of disorganizing the history and disorganizing that we should grow more chocolate beans in Guatemala than coffee beans because all the coffee we grow, it's only to export. So that also brings poverty because only rich people get the profits of coffee. And we only get like $4 a day, you know, picking up coffee. So uh, basically what we are trying to do right now is to disorganize all that history and then also go and find the elders, you know, find all the grandparents that uh, kind of have answers of what the ancestry Maya culture is. I think the second question, uh, it was uh, uh, that right, uh, Jay was asking me, it's, you know, within the war in Guatemala ended in 1996, and there was only 250,000 refugees, you know, Guatemalan refugees. Within 10 years, we uh, quadrupled that amount. So right now, there is one million and a half Guatemalans, like I said, living all over the U.S. But now, you know, just this week, the Obama administration is saying that it's going to deport a lot of people back to Guatemala because of election purposes. You be nice with the voters and say you get, they're getting rid of immigrants. So yesterday on Guatemala newspaper says the Guatemala needs to get ready to receive all these Guatemalans who are going to be chained. You know, you're going to be captured in the restaurants, you're going to be captured in uh, vegetable fields in the U.S., you're going to be captured in houses and they're going to get chained and then they're going to take them into the major airports of the U.S. and they will be shipped back to Guatemala. So to me, you know, it's a great advantage when you send back Guatemalans here because now we are like study abroad students. And we, and we spy you know, on, on whatever the U.S. is doing because we've been inside of houses, we've been inside of hotels, we've been inside schools. And right now, I think that's why, you know, as an organization, we're also taking that advantage of also developing because right now, I mean, I was a cook in the U.S., you know, now I can cook my own food here. And I can, uh, right now I'm learning how to grow vegetables, something that I never did in my life because I was in the U.S. most of the time. So right now the idea is to develop country in a whole different way. And this might sound a little bit contradictory, but uh, somehow we need to also uh, develop the country. I don't know if that answers the question. Perfectly, thank you. Hi. <laughs> How would it be possible to convince first worlders to change and give up all of their stuff? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that well. Can you repeat that? Yeah. How would it be possible to convince first worlders to change and give up all their stuff? Great question. Uh, I think you, I, I, I've lived in the U.S. for, uh, for, for uh, 14 years. And I not only was addicted to coffee, but I was also addicted to South Park. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but I think my, my, my favorite episode of South Park is when Walmart comes to South Park and destroys all the small businesses. I'm going to give you that as a homework for today. <laughs> go, and, go and watch that episode today. Because at the end, you know, the kids uh, are going to burn uh, Walmart, and then the next day they build up another one. And then finally the kids realize that the ones that are sustaining uh, Walmart is everyone in town. 
And I think, you know, like U.S. has, a lot, you know, a lot of millions of people there. And then uh, I, we always said, you know, that if every single human being would live like Americans, we would need like four or five planets because all the resources we take. Right? I think it's a huge amount of, you know, cell phones, computers, you know, and that thing with mining, you know, it's like people are sucking to like uh, rare metals all over the mountains because every day we want something new for ourselves, you know, a new iPhone, you know, a new tablet, you know, a new, you know, car. And then we want, you know, faster cars every day. We need more fuels, you know. I mean, to me, it was very crazy that on, on Christmas Day, people were eating guacamole in the U.S., and then the avocados were brought from Chile. You know, can you guys imagine that waste of fuel, you know, just to get you an avocado to your house on Christmas Day? Right, we are getting French fries from McDonald's here in Guatemala, but then, then the meat and the, and the potatoes come from Brazil, and they need to be shipped from Brazil to Florida, and then from Florida to Guatemala, and then get a semi for nine hours to get a French fry here in my hometown. So that's a, you know, we are, that, that by consuming products that are from a long distance, that's when we are destroying the planet as we speak. Thank you. That's another question. Everyone should feel free to ask questions. Um, so for a lot of us here in this room, um, this next presidential election will be our first time voting. And in the media, a lot recently, we have been surrounded by some pretty hasty generalizations about um, immigrants, as you've spoken a lot about, and how, you know, they're illegal or calling them aliens, how they're taking our jobs, or, you know, the solution with a few political candidates, i.e. Donald Trump, is to build a wall. And I'm just curious as to your observations and the things that you see um, within the United States or have seen within the United States and how, you know, us as future voters can approach those issues and think a little bit more critically about the generalizations that are being portrayed in the media. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think Donald Trump is uh, I was checking Batman movie yesterday, and he's like the Joker now of the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> he only makes me laugh because I think you know uh, we all are immigrants at the end, you know, and you guys are descendant of immigrants. Yes. And I think the the, the right owners of uh, all the lands that you are sitting on today are the Native Americans. But we are not claiming back that land, you know. I always say that, you know, like capitalism, it's like uh, a full storage of uh, sugar, right? And then aunts uh, love sugar, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think all the accumulation of the wealth of the planet, it's sitting on the U.S. And that's why a lot of immigrants came, you know, even from Europe from Africa, from, you know, from Ireland, from Middle East, from Asia, you know, I, I, I work with people from Tibet, I work uh, with people from Japan, you know, they were doing sushi in different restaurants, but now I think there is also another big issue in the U.S. is the color of the skin. Yes. Right? Uh, I was just talking to this guy who is a, a, a tomato pick, uh, picker uh, in, in Immokalee, Florida, and he was telling me the whole history of Africans being slaves until the 60s, picking up tomatoes. So when the, the civil rights movements came, you know, they all disappeared from the tomato fields. And then the big owners of companies they didn't have any workers, so they brought Mexicans to work. And then the Mexicans were shipped back to the to Mexico, and now they were like uh, some sort of like a new modern slavery uh, labor where they were bringing Mayans from the highlands of Guatemala to pick up tomatoes in Florida. But also, you know, guess who's doing the dishes in the U.S.? Guess who's cleaning the the, the all the buildings in New York? You know, guess who is 
uh, taking care of babies, you know, na as nannies. We are, and then I think the Republicans are very hypocrites because they were the ones who wanted cheap labor at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So they opened the gates of the U.S. silently in the, during the 80s and 90s, but now since the economical you know, collapse of the U.S., now they're using us as scapegoats, yeah. right? But then we are cheap labor in the U.S., and that's also creates some tension among uh, whites and blacks because the U.S. is not producing anything. You are just consuming things, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's a sad thing that they're used as, as scapegoats. And also on the other half, you know, Guatemala, Mexico, and Latin America is used as the backyard of the U.S. where they can come and pick up whatever they want, you know? So I think you have to rethink about what the U.S. role is in the world today. If the U.S. wants to be great again, needs to change. The <laughs> you guys. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> are there any U.S. values that you do believe in that are helpful to a global economy or on any level? What was that again? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> Are there any U.S. values that you do believe in? Yes. Um, could you care to share them? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to apologize if I'm making you feel bad. It's not a purpose. It's not a purpose of this conversation. I think, you know, uh, I'm 43 years old right now, and when I was uh, probably your age, I was really angry at the, at the U.S. because what they have done to my people. But then at the end, remember that irony of life is that I was against the country where I ended up living for 14 years. So basically, I was a teenager when I got to the U.S. and I grew up there. And now I see a big difference between governments and people. Right? A lot of people from the U.S., from coast to coast, gave me food and gave me their houses, you know, I, I, and gave me, you know, their time. And something that I really admire from the U.S. is the sense of vision that the country has. Right? And then since you're a kid, you kind of have a vision where you want to go. Uh, I think, you know, you guys have access to a lot of information. You have, guys have access to a lot of education. And then basically, you know, I mean, the school that, that you guys have, the theaters, you know, the soccer fields, this is something that I wish I could have here in Guatemala. You know, there is a lot of uh, 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 some sort of like discipline, you know, of, 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 of people in, the, in there that it kind of makes you, you know, move forward. But then I realized, you know, when I, I read the, the history of the U.S., I think there is, a, there is a, a book called The People's History of the U.S., I think is the name of the book. You know, uh, basically today, you know, U.S. sends people all over the planet and grabs culture and then blends it up. So, you know, U.S. culture, it's a fusion of all the planets. But I think, you know, it's up to you guys to change the destiny of the country. And I think something that Desp is doing right now is we are creating not a separation between the U.S. and Guatemala, but instead, you know, we are connecting to people, you know. Uh, I invited, you know, the students that did the presentation on that one, and I'm inviting you to come here because also the South can teach something to the North, right? But, uh, I mean, I, I learned how to cook Thai food in the U.S., but I didn't have to go to Thailand. Uh, you know, I learned, uh, you know, how to hang out with African Americans, and that was almost, I never thought about that I was going to do that. So I really, you know, like I said, bottom line, something that I admire from the U.S. is the vision that the country has. Right. All right, so while uh, students gather the courage to come up and ask another question, I'm going to steal the mic. Um, you know that uh, Noam Chomsky had the, 
uh, misfortune of, of preceding you, you know, now you're, you know, Noam Chomsky, you know, and then we have Willy Barreno, you know, it's crazy. So, um, but John Holloway is getting ready, and you know John, so he's going he's gonna to talk our ears off too. Um, my question for you, I'm thinking about some things that Noam Chomsky talked about with the students, and one of them was the idea that in our society we make decisions as individuals. We don't make decisions collectively. So when we make decisions, it's to benefit ourselves. So you go back to the vision that we have, the access to information, and so much of that information, so much of those resources are for us to see as things that benefit us as individuals. And they aren't right. things that we consume and act and do that are for the collective, that are for the benefit of all people and other people. So we want right. to, I don't know, I just can you talk about that imbalance? And then the other thing is he talked about the, the concept of indigenous comunidad. Mm -hmm. as the last resort for humanity and I'm wondering if you agree with that and uh, if, yes. you, if you do and can comment on that yeah uh, I think you know uh, Nam Chomsky also mentioned that yeah like like you're saying uh, the world is entering into a crisis right now because there is a lot of separation of humankind I think cell phones and internet has making people more like machines than human beings today. Like I said, you know, I was suffering from uh, bipolarity and anxiety and depression in the U.S. because less and less I was having community in the States, you know. I was once in Madison, Wisconsin, when uh, at university there, they had an iPod party. And then there was a hall with a lot of lights, and then all the people brought their iPods, and they have their, you know, earphones, and each one of them was dancing a different music as they wanted. I think that was, to me, like the end of civilization, because, <laughs> because it was a party that was completely separate, you know, and Steve Jobs created the iMac, you know, the iPod, the iTunes, the i, it's everything about i, you know, it's individual society, and we should create, if I would create a new computer or technology company will be the we, you know, the we phone, the we, the us, you know, it's about us, you know, and, and, and when you create a community, you know, when you chat, not on Facebook, but you ch chat for 20 minutes with your neighbor, you know, you will, you will start building up community. And this is something that I think is missing from, from, from modern society. I want to, uh, I, I hope you can see this picture there. Can you see it? Order <laughs> chaos. That's two different ways of organizing. When you tear apart, a, 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 you know, a branch of trees and then you order it that, that way, you create chaos. And I think this picture kind of talks about how we disorganize because we've been put into a chaos. The idea is to create an organic, you know, order. It's how we are so different, but at the end, we are part of one root, that it's the human civilization. That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone? Fortner, you got one? Anyone? Someone come on up. Let's give, uh, let's give Willie one more. Someone come on up. Jake, you're, you're dying. You've got something in your brain back there. Come on, someone come on up. All right, well, well great. We've got a community member, non-student. Now, this is, this is an old friend of mine. Es, es un vasco, eh? Cuidado. <laughs> Hi, Willie. Uh, a pleasure uh, talking with you, and, and thank you so much for uh, speaking to us. Uh, here's a hard, hard question, I think, uh, simply because uh, we don't want to talk, talk about it, but I think you... you I consider you an expert on this. Um, do you think there's still room for armed struggle uh, in the... Uh, I'm, I'm not listening clear what you're saying. Sorry, Billy. Hey. Um, yeah. Pleasure again. Uh, hard question, I, I assume, simply because of the sensitive uh, topic, but do you think there's still uh, room or a, a place for armed struggle in the indigenous movements, and, and any other movement for that matter? 
Uh, you know, in my own in my own personal experiences, I wouldn't go and fight again again a war. You know, I think it it, it really destroyed my family and destroyed the history of my people because until today, you know, about seventy percent of the population in Guatemala suffers from post traumatic stress disorder. I heard, you know, the troops in the U.S. on the other side, you know, troops that have been in Afghanistan or Iraq are also suffering, you know, a lot of post-traumatic stress disorders. And then the suicide rates in the U.S. are going higher and higher. Uh, that destroys the family and destroys communities also in the U.S. as we speak. Uh, today, you know, it's 2015. Our dream for Deswa is to teach kids how to use knives and how to use cutting boards and how to cut lettuces and tomatoes. Right? That's, I think, you know, to, to the student that asked me the question, what did I learn in the U.S.? I learned how to cook, and then I forgot about to fight. You know, I think the new struggle for people in the next 50 years is going to be about food and water. And I think, you know, those resources we need to take care. And I would, you know, create an army of cooks and chefs, right, and farmers, you know, because if we have if we have that, we can feed people. But I don't think, I don't want to see another war in Latin America. But I think, you know, tensions are increasing because of the, of the separation of people in governments. And when that, you create that extreme, that's when war starts. And I think that could start on any of the, of the families. You know, if you separate, you know, kids from parents and live in the same house, you would start a war in your own house. So I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a hard question and I just don't want to see another war in Guatemala. And I think the Zapatistas are creating in Chiapas a very uh, peaceful resistance where you can uh, avoid the government as much as possible and then you build up community. All right, Willie, there's no word for time, uh, for hours or minutes or seconds in Mayan, but unfortunately we have them in English. So we're gonna, uh -huh. we're gonna have to part ways. Um, the girls wanna say goodbye to you and um, we're gonna start with uh, John Holloway and listen okay. to how he, uh, his ideas. But uh, again, thank you and we'll be in lots of contact and uh, we'll try to get some students to come down and, and, and have fun with you in Guatemala. Yeah. Please come to Guatemala. Okay, we'll here, to... here are the girls. They want to say goodbye. You can go close. <laughs> <laughs> well, Willie, we just wanted to say thank you so thank much for all you've done. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope you can yeah. take care of you. <laughs> yeah, we'll Skype you. All right. <laughs> and hopefully you guys can come back to Guatemala or any of the students in the back are more than welcome to come and visit us. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, we are fine. <laughs> yeah. Good. So good. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my crazy ideas and crazy experiences. Let's give it a applause. Let's give it a applause. Adios. Adios, amigo. Hello, Jay. It's, I'm pretty happy to be there with you. How, how is it going? It's going really well. We've had a wonderful conference so far, and I don't know if you got the link, if you were able to see any of this morning. Uh, the students had a great time with, with Professor Chomsky and Mr. <coughs> and all the presentations are wonderful. And, and again, thank you for giving us your time. And uh, Not at all. It's... It's just, I mean, it just seems to me such a fantastic idea what you're doing. It's really a pleasure to be invited. It's, it seems wonderful to me. 
here from afar, but it seems a great idea. Thank you. And uh, just a, another an aside, we, um, some of the students in the, in the research leading up to this project had a nice long two-hour conversation with the Mexico Solidarity Network. And um, while, they were, <clears throat> while they were talking, all of the college students in the background, we mentioned that you would be Skyping in, and they were all very excited. And they were like, oh, John, John. <laughs> That was pretty awesome. Um, those are the kind of compliments I like. Um, so I think what we can do is if you just have some comments, I, you know, we sent you some questions and ideas if you have some comments about indigenous movements, and then we do it for questions with, with what remaining time you're able to give us. OK. What I thought was that we would, I would, I mean, the question's a great idea. It makes it much easier for me. It's much, it's much better if I know a little bit what you're asking about where you are. Um, so I thought I would just focus on the questions to start off with. What I was wondering, I don't know if they're collective questions or are there particular people who want to ask the questions so that I actually see where they're coming from? Fair enough. What we'll do is there's a microphone right behind you. They'll approach the microphone and just talk into the camera. If that's okay. 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 Great. Right. With the same questions. Yes. Um, or, or actually, you can go ahead and start, and then um, if you just want to read the questions ahead of time and then comment, and then if there's stuff at the end that, that people would like to clear up. Okay, that's fine. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Good morning to, yeah, to everybody. Um, thanks a lot for the questions. Um, I, yeah, as I said, what I, I don't have anything very formal prepared. What I thought was just to work through the questions, take them one by one. If you want to interrupt me or or add things to the questions, then that would be super. That would be great. Okay, the first question I have is, what is it autonomy, as you understand it, from the indigenous movements across Latin America? And what I was thinking, and I suppose in general, I think that if you ask a question, you should always ask a sort of sub-question, which would be, why am I asking that question? Um, no, why are you asking, or why are we here? Why do we want to talk about autonomy from the indigenous movements in Latin America? I'm not indigenous. I imagine that most of you are not indigenous. So why do we want to talk about that? And I think if we want to talk about it, it's not just because they are interesting. It's also because of something in us, some sort of um, anxiety, some sort of, um, I don't know, movement, some sort of questioning in us. In other words, if we want to talk, I mean, it's just what I imagine. I don't know if it's the case, obviously. But if we're talking about indigenous movements, we are also talking about ourselves. In a way, questions, I suppose, act as mirrors, no? So if we want to talk about autonomy and the indigenous movements, in a way that probably reflects what? I would say, well, in my case, it reflects an anger. It reflects an anger, a feeling that the world is wrong, no? A feeling that there's something wrong with the world, a feeling not just of anger, a feeling of hope. It's a feeling that, okay, I'm surrounded by so many things that seem to me to be wrong, not just individually wrong, but systematically wrong, right? But I'm not prepared to accept it. I'm not prepared to give up hope. I'm not prepared to say, um, well, there's nothing that can be done. And then I see this movement or these movements arising, and they seem to represent something quite different. They seem to 
represent or to give um, sustenance, I suppose, to my hope. And that's really why I'm interested in them. So it's kind of a mixture, in, I think, in my part of anger, a feeling that things are wrong, systematically wrong. It's a feeling of hope, feeling that things really could be very, very different. And it's also, I suppose, a feeling of confusion, a feeling of confusion in the sense of a search for an answer, a search for a way forward. No. If I knew exactly how we go forward, then I probably wouldn't be very interested in these movements that wouldn't necessarily fit into the way that we want, that I think we should go forward. But since these movements actually do present something, they present, I suppose, principles of life or principles of how to do things, principles of how to relate, principles of how to move against the present system. Um, and I think that's what, what, what makes them um, extremely interesting. And what is, what is autonomy? I suppose I think of autonomy, I don't think of autonomy from the indigenous movements. I think of autonomy um, first. I suppose I think of autonomy in my own context, um, in the sense of well, what does it mean? And I think what autonomy perhaps means for me is a way of seeing the world. It's a way of thinking about possibilities of action. It's a way, perhaps above all, of assuming our responsibility. You know, if we see, if we see that we live in a world that is systematically and obscenely unjust, if we see that we live in a world that is based on a constant aggression, military aggression and aggression in all sorts of ways. If we see that we live in a world that destroying, is destroying the basis of human existence, because it now surely must be fairly clear that the current destruction to the natural environment puts in doubt, at least, the existence of humans over the next few centuries. If we see that the present governments or the political structure seems to be incapable of improving that situation, this situation or changing it radically, then I think that really what we're faced with is, is our own responsibility. No, it's really a question of, well, okay, it's a mess, we know that, but how do we go beyond that? If it's such a mess, and if we can see that governments or states make this mess even worse, then instead of just complaining, we have to take up our own responsibility and do something about it. And doing something about it doesn't mean, or doesn't just mean, trying to convince millions of people that we are right, because it doesn't work that way. It means saying, well, even if things seem so awful, we are going to go ahead and change things. No. So it means in a high school like yours, you say, well, OK, what this sort of topic doesn't fit into the normal curriculum, but we think it's really important, so we're going to go ahead and do it. And here in Puebla, I suppose I have the good fortune to be in a graduate school where we have basically the same, same, same attitude, where we say, well, yeah, the world is a mess. Capitalism is an absolute disaster. What we are going to do in this graduate school is devote all our efforts to thinking about how we get rid of capitalism. We're not going to worry about whether 
necessarily about persuading old sociology departments to do to the same. We are going to go ahead and do it. And I think it's the same with the, with the Zapatistas. For example, when they rose up in 1994, um, it, it's really a process. I mean, first they said, right, we're going to overthrow the government. And then they saw, well, no, they hoped, I think, they say that they hoped that the whole, whole country would rise up with them. The whole country didn't rise up with them, but there was obviously a huge sympathy for them throughout the country. Then they agreed to enter into a dialogue with the government for indigenous rights. And they um, reached an agreement, the Acuerdos de San Andres, um, on indigenous rights, which the government was supposed to implement. And the government didn't implement it. And the Zapatistas then made, um, organized a huge march to Mexico City in 2001, um, demanding the implementation of these measures. And still nothing happened. The parliament actually enact, enacted measures which were much worse, which increased discrimination against the, the indigenous. So the Zapatistas said, well, right, we're going to go ahead on our own. We are going to implement in our territory um, with our people these measures. And that's, I think, what, what, what I understand by autonomy is, is just saying, well, well, I suppose, well, you know, what do we do? The world is a disaster. We are actually confronted with a real emergency. What on earth do we do? You know, and organizing ourselves in a party or just doesn't work. Trying to change the world through the Democratic Party or whatever won't work. We've seen over and over again how even apparently radical um, political parties when they came to government, like the, the uh, Syriza in Greece, there, what, a year and a half ago, tried to change things, and it didn't work. It doesn't work. So in that sense, we have to say, you know, this is our responsibility. We have to do it. We have to get on with it. You know, we form groups, I suppose. We get together. We get together in the school and say, well, we are going to walk in the opposite direction. I suppose that maybe that's what autonomy means for me. It's this decision that we are going to walk in the opposite direction. We're going to walk against the present tendency of destruction. You know, we are going to, if we see the world being turned more and more into a world of commodities, a world of things to be bought and sold, we say, well, we're going in the other direction. Okay, let's hope that people will follow us, or let's hope that some people will follow us. So in that sense, it's really a different concept, a conception, I think, of, of the possibilities of social or political action. And in a way it results, I mean, the whole, the talk of autonomy, the idea of autonomy as a radical politics, really grows out of the failure of the revolutionary movements in the 20th century, the failure of the Soviet Union, obviously, but also the failure of the revolutionary movements in Latin America and Africa, etc. No, and it, it, it part of the reflection on that failure. Well, that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't succeed in giving us a better world. So let's think of going about it in a different way. Um, that connects up then with indigenous traditions. I think it connects up with indigenous traditions in the sense that in the in indigenous communities are very often very strong communities with a very long tradition of resistance. Um, and they have managed in many cases 
to build up some sort of strong community-based movement that says, well, we're not doing things that way. You know, we're going to go against the trend. We're going to go in the direction of what we understand as dignity. Um, shall I, okay, that's my thoughts about question one. Shall I just carry on or do you want to intervene or? Um, any questions on that? No, I think uh, Sir John, you can continue on if you like with question two. Sorry, go on. Ah. You're fine, go ahead and uh, continue. I'll go on to question two, okay. All right. And the second question says, does the Western tradition have any precedence of anything akin to it? And I suppose my answer is, well, there you are. There we are. You know, what are you doing in this conference? What am I doing talking to you? In a way, it, you know, this is it. I mean, there exists, I think, th throughout the world. It, 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 wonderful traditions of resistance, wonderful traditions of doing things in a different way. There exists what is or what used to be called working class culture in the cities. You know? People just rejecting the values that are imposed upon them by capitalist society and saying, no, well, that doesn't make any sense to us. We are actually going to live in a different way. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean outright conflict. It doesn't necessarily this mean the same sort of movement as we see in the case of the indigenous movements. Does it does mean the ones you scratch the surface, there is this huge wealth, this huge richness of people saying, no, we won't accept that. We will do things in our own way. And I suppose that's what autonomy means to me. It's simply just, no, no, thank you. That's, that doesn't seem right. We're going to do things in a different way. And we're going to try and do it collectively. And we're going to try and organize it. And we're going to try and make it effective. And we're going to try and defend it against the inevitable attacks. And we're going to say that we're proud to be walking again in the opposite direction. That, and yes, so that, exi that exists all over the world. That was number two. <laughs> Any, shall I go on to three? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Is organizing complex multicultural industrial postmodern societies indigenous, in indigenous ways utopic? I think. <laughs> I think, no, I think the problem for us or the way that we have talked about it really since the start of the Zapatista uprising is we talk, think of it in terms of urban Zapatismo, Zapatismo Urbano. How, how do we think of Zapatismo in a city context, in an urban context. Because for most of us, certainly it's my case, I, I'm not sure about Montana, but most of us, certainly most of my students here, we live in the city. Okay, how do you, you know, we don't have our own land. We don't have our own land, and if we did have our own land, we wouldn't be very happy just living on beans and, and tortillas. We're actually used to 
different ways of living, different standards of living, I suppose, different ways of eating. How do we think, and even if we don't have land, even if we had land, we wouldn't know what to do with it. We wouldn't know how to cultivate it. So how do we think of that sort of movement or building movement with similar principles in an urban context? And I think that I think that that is very difficult. I think it's a big question for us. Um, we can think of all sorts of examples when we think about it. We could look. We look to Argentina in 2001, 2002, where there was a huge uprising in many of the cities, uh, popular assemblies, occupation of factories. Um, a huge unemployed workers' movement, etc. No. So we look to Argentina in 2001, 2002. We look to Athens and other Greek cities, I think, especially in 2008, 2009. We look perhaps to Venezuela in the early 2000s. We look. look you can see examples. I mean, there are actually lots, lots of examples of urban organization along similar principles, principles of horizontality, principles of assembly, uh, taking decisions in assemblies, principles of, um, yeah, taking over production as far as possible, principles of producing our own food through urban community gardens or through occupying um, spaces in and around the cities. Um, there are all sorts of things like that, but not developed as much as the indigenous movements. Have I lost you? No. Ah, OK. <laughs> As I'm now looking at the sea and the boat going through the sea. Anyway, this, okay. Um, so there are all sorts of all sorts of examples, but I um, I just don't see any any other way forward. Not not in terms of an organizing in an indigenous way, but really organizing on the basis of self determination on the basis of collective self-determination, on the basis of assuming our, our own collective responsibility for the, for the planet, finally. OK, quest, question four is, can you still hear me? Because I can't see you. Yes, you can. OK, let's go on. Um, question four. No, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm for some reason I'm looking at a boat going through the sea. I don't know. <laughs> if, if you can hear me, that's fine. I'll just go on. Question four How would it be possible to convince the vast majority of first worlders to change and give up all our stuff? In a way, I think. Um, ah, there you are, I see you now. Um, you have to think in terms, I think if you think of people, you know, just convincing them, I think that probably doesn't work. I think you have to think that movements grow out of anger. Movements grow out of us being attacked. No? Like lots and lots of communities now in Mexico, for example, have found that they are being attacked by what are called the projects of death, mining projects, the introduction of mines, which will destroy their communities completely, destroy their way of living, um, force um, people to migrate, etc. And the reaction comes from there. And I think 
even though some of us, or I suppose some of us, yes, live relatively comfortably or live relatively comfortably for the moment, there is a sense in which we, if we think about it, we are all constantly under attack. Um, university con conditions, for example, in universities have changed dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years. No? The spaces, the possibility of developing critical thought in schools and universities um, is very much under attack. In Mexico at the moment, there is a huge conflict between the government and school teachers because the educational reform that the government is pushing through breaks the links of the teachers with their communities, attacks the possibility of questioning the rule of the market and of money. And I think it is when we come under attack that we begin to think, well, there's something wrong with the system. There's something wrong with the way that the whole thing works. There's something wrong with the world that is dominated by money. How, and we, we build from there. That's really how it happens, I think. It's not just a question of saying, I mean, it, it's good, but it's not just a question of saying to people, well, it would be more reasonable to build our communities on the basis of, say, the Zapatista model. So that brings me to five, and Noam Chomsky commented earlier this indigenous commun communalidad as um, possibly our last resort. Do I agree? No, I don't think I do agree. Um, because because we have to do things our own ways. I mean, the Zapatistas, quite rightly, have always insisted they cannot be seen as a model. It is really up to ourselves. It is up to you there in, in Montana. It is up to here, us here in Puebla to find different ways of doing things. Now, we could be inspired by the indigenous communities. But I don't think it's a question of us reproducing those communities. And I don't think it's a question of last resort. It's actually a question of thinking, thinking here and now, how do we see the way forward? Um, how, do we, how do we see the way forward? Um, I think it's very difficult. I think it's something that we all have to think about all the time as collectively as possible. We look to other movements for inspiration, but I don't, I don't think that we can ever take them as a model. I think we also have to think that our own movements, our own moving forward, nearly always grows out of an intense awareness that things are wrong, that society simply is not working as it is. Question six, what about the unappealing aspect of a lack of freedom of choice and inefficiency in a world without markets? I mean, I suppose my answer is no, it's just the opposite. A world with markets uh, is a world of total unfreedom um, and also a world of enormous inefficiency. Now, if you just think of the huge quantity of people in the world who are excluded from activity because, because they're not employed, because to employ them would not increase the profits of anybody, therefore they're unemployed, that is real, real inefficiency. Also, if you think the enormous quantity of people in the world who are employed simply, simply um, to maintain order, to maintain the respect for property, um, for private police, security guards, um, not to mention psychologists, psychiatrists, parents, etc. But a huge amount of people in the world 
just devote themselves to maintaining a system that is so obviously ruinous, ruinous in terms of present-day human life, ruinous in terms of the future of humanity. Seven, is capitalism incompatible with democracy? Um, no, I don't think it's incompatible with democracy, but it is incompatible with self-determination. That is to say that um, capitalist democracy is very hollow and is becoming more and more hollow. Um, it is becoming more and more clear that the real determinant of social development is, is money, is the pursuit of profit. Um, so I see huge difference between um, democracy and self-determination. Self-determination simply in the sense of I individually or we collectively will decide what we want to do with our lives. Eight, how would this generation of young people help bring out a more sane and just world? It's a fabulous question. Um, a fabulous question, obviously, for you to answer. But I suppose, um, I, for me, it's very important to say we don't know. We don't have the answers. Um, that revolutionaries of 34 years, 30 or 40 years ago would say, yes, we have the answers. Listen, I will tell you what to do. And I think we are now in a position where we have to say, no, we don't have the answers. We don't have the answers. And therefore, brilliant saying of the Zapatistas, preguntando caminamos, asking we walk we go forward by asking but it's also because asking is the revolution in a sense it is once you say we don't have the answers then you you move into a different politics you move into a politics of saying well let's chat talk about it what do you think what do i think you move into a politics of mutual respect um, mutual recognition, and that is actually the world we want to create. It is a world based not on the domination of money, but a world of mutual recognition, a world in which we collectively take decisions on how we move forward. How we get there, we don't really know. I think I would say, well, we have learned from experience that it is not through the state. The state won't take us there because the state is actually part of the system we want to change. And if it's not through the state, it's not through parties, political parties either. Um, it's through the creation, I suppose, the creation of cracks, the creation of moments or spaces in which we say, you know, we're not going to follow the the system, we are going to create something else. You know, and I think it says, well, your generation of young people, I think you've got a tremendous responsibility, partly because if we take seriously what people are saying about the climate um, and the destruction of the natural environment, then really we are living in an emergency. And, you know, it, it's up to you at the most simple level to say, well, enough, you know, that's enough. We don't want to, to go on in a system that is destroying the world. We don't want to go on in a system that is so brutally just enough. We are going to create something else. You know, and maybe we will make mistakes creating it. But we have to go ahead. And then this going ahead and this creating something else, then yes, the indigenous movements are an enormous, fantastic source of inspiration. 
you know, and many of the city movements over the last uh, 30, 40 years are a huge source of inspiration. And yes, the Kurdish struggles as well in Iraq, Syria, Turkey are a huge, again, a really inspiring movement trying to say, you know, saying new things, carrying out new forms of organization. You know, but if you ask, well, how would this generation of people hang, help bring about a more sane and just world? It's a question for you. you know? that, that's it. <laughs> so. Uh... All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Holloway, for your time. And. Um, I'm going to let these students go get some, uh, some lunch. It's lunchtime in this area. And, yes. uh, um, but again, on behalf of, uh, of the Missoula community that showed up here today, Big Sky High School, um, and, and um, all of us involved in this project, we can't thank you enough for the time you've given us, um, the patience, uh, and the responses. I was, I was commenting earlier that uh, Professor Chomsky was quick to reply, as were you, and to have such important uh, intellectual and pol uh, public figures so accessible and so readily uh, participatory is a special thing. And um, I think um, should we do this project again next year, we will come calling again because we've really appreciated uh, all you've given us. And thank you very, very much. And if you have any last words, we'll let you uh, say goodbye and, and uh, from Puebla. Yeah. Let, let me, two things. I think firstly, sorry, I didn't leave more time for questions. I got lost in your questions. I should have stopped earlier and it would have been nice to hear you. But, but, but obviously, yes, you need to go and have lunch and hungry questions are always dangerous questions. <laughs> and the other thing is really the invitation for me was, wow. I don't know, it's very difficult at the moment, I suppose, with all that's happening in the world and with all that's happening in Mexico, it's very, it's very easy to get depressed. It's very easy to begin to feel, I know there isn't really a way forward. And then to get an invitation from a high school like you is just a kind of flare of light in the night. Hmm. And that's tremendous. That is fantastic. And thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Um, I think the students are going to kind of fill in behind me and uh, wave to you and say thank you among this audience. So I'm going to have them come up to the microphone here and, and say hello and, and goodbye, OK? okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so not everyone's back in here yet, but our next guest speaker is not quite ready to Skype with us, and so we decided to add in Rap on the Wii. Um, Anna and John will be presenting on that topic. Um, answer, ask questions after the presentation. Hola, me llamo John. Y me llamo Anna. Next slide. Uh, Geográficos. Isla de Pascua es en su entra a uh, desmiltrecion mijas el oestra de la costa de Chile en el Oceano Pacificos eh, y es la de Pascua es 60 a uh, 13 cuadrar mías y continen, contienes cuatro volcanos uh, Rano Recu, Rano Quay, Terra Vaca y Poque.
la historia. El rap nui se establecieron en Isla de Pascua entre uh, Tresión y cuat un mil dosión, si, sí, uh, los personas con de origen uh, polinesico, el Rapa Nui fueron los primeros personas habita el isla y con responsable uh, para el introducción de las batatas y botella de calabesa. Ambos te temas se han convertido en una parte obligatoria de los Rapa Nui dieta. El conflicto. So, el conflicto para el Rapa Nui es el gobierno de Chile. Um, el gobierno de Chile robado la tierra a uh, Sagrado, um, que las personas indígenas, uh, la población de per personas indígenas es 6,000 y Todiva, Todiva recibe 80,000 turistas al año. Uh, la tierra que para personas turistas. So, el, siblo, el símbolo de Isla de Pascua es una andrigal remio. Um, remio es una adorno pectoral hecho de madera y usadas por las mujeres de las rapanues tribo. Uh, a un cabezas humanas, un cada extremo, la medio luna representa un canoa poleniza, el lado interior está pensada para, para uh, cantiana latiza, Re, remios son una tradición de las islas Salomón que han sido uh, aptos, adaptados por las Rapa Nui. So. So, Chile tomó la isla hace poco más de un siglo. Se tomó la Rapa Nui y las puso en una ciudad de la isla. Um, Chile ha prestado la tierra por el grano de las ovejas y las turistas. Eh, las personas indígenas amanzan independencia para Chile um, en agosto de uh, 2000. Uh, los Rapa Nui el único aeropuerto de la isla durante dos días y dos ocasiones en diciembre de 2010, el gobierno envió a la policía militar para desalojar manifestantes de ocupar un edificio público. Eh, los contactos, eh, la embajada de Chile en Estados Unidos. Um, nos, nosotros contactos um, y la embajada de Estados Unidos en Chile y UNESCO y Polynesian Culture Center en Hawaii. Hawaii. Silence. Y um, Hage Wesley Uh, de la BYU College en Hawaii. Uh, gracias.